Good evening and welcome to our program. This is the Word and Sword TV broadcast brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ that meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. And we're just thrilled to death that you've invited us into your home tonight, that you're watching the program and that you're ready to study the Bible. We appreciate it. If you love, study, love Bible study, this is the place for you because we're going to be talking tonight about conversions. We're also going to be talking about uh, the marriage question and divorce and what does the Bible say about that. That was a question that was uh, asked last week and uh, we did not get a chance to deal with that on the air. And so we're going to deal with that in the first part of our program. But before we do that, we want to uh, invite you to call in. This program is live. It's one of the few live programs that are available these days and it is, uh, interacts with you. We have call screeners that are waiting to receive your call at 828-485-5555. And if you would like to <clears throat> come on the program and uh, actually uh, converse on the program, they will screen you first, like all people do. Uh, you call Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity, they're, gonna, they're going to screen you. I'm not in any ways in their class, but uh, you do have to screen calls. And so they will be doing that. And, uh, if they put you through, then you will be on the air if you so choose. You don't have to be, though. If you just want to leave your question with the with the screeners and the call the operators, they will be glad to deal with it themselves. Or if you would like to uh, me to deal with it, they will get that to me, and I will deal with it on the air before the program's out today. And so uh, we want to thank you again for tuning in tonight. You can call and ask for a copy of this presentation and ask for a free Bible correspondence course. So many people, you know, they just look, they just say, I'm going to read the Bible, but they don't have any, any rhyme or reason to it. And uh, the Bible correspondence course helps you to have some type of order to your Bible study, uh, focusing on salvation and the plan of redemption that God has for man. And uh, just a little bit about the Bible and how did we get the Bible? Where did it come from? Those types of things are dealt with on the correspondence course. And again, it is free of charge. You don't even have to pay postage. We will make sure we get all that to you. You can also call in and ask for a free tract on any Bible subject, any subject that you might have that's a Bible subject. We will have the availability. We will find and search uh, until we find a product that will be uh, able to answer your question uh, in detail according to what God's Word says. Also you can call and ask for a map of the building uh, of how to get to our building and uh, most people have some type of GPS now but if you just want to just read a map uh, we have that available if you would like and you can call and ask to be added to our bulletin mailing list and that's called the Beacon and we would be glad to get that to you. I'd love to have you on that, uh, on that uh, medium. And that is uh, basically, it comes out, uh, it's mailed out quarterly, but it is a monthly pu publication. And again, that is free. And you can get free Bible study aids. Uh, and again, there's nothing that beats the Bible. The Bible is its best commentary. But there are some study helps. Uh, sometimes you know where a word is and what a word of a verse is, but you don't know what the verse is. So there's concordances on there. There's all types of uh, study uh, uh, dictionaries and things like that, and language helps that you can go into on that. And uh, several different sites where you can get different types of sermons on different subjects, and also www.wordandsword.com is our site, and a uh, number of links are on that site. So you call in and you, uh, or you go to that site, and uh, if, if you would like to leave, leave a post up there, you can. Uh, you can call in again tonight with a biblical question or comment, and we will do our best to give you a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer to what your question is. And if we don't know the answer, we won't try to fool you into making you believe that we do. We'll find the answer, and we'll do what we can to get that to you. You can like us on Facebook also by going to www.facebook.com slash word and sword and like or unlike or whatever uh, on there and uh, leave, a, leave some type of post up there if you have a question. The same thing on Twitter at word and sword. And then you also can go to www.facebook.com slash Newton capital N North Carolina capitals and then Church of Christ. 
And uh, either one of those, any one of those, we would love to have a, a discussion with you or a question and answer if you would like and have a little bit more freedom there uh, in that venue, if you would like, uh, to where you can get your Bible questions answered. <clears throat> so many times today, people have questions about the Bible, but they don't know how to ask the question, or they just don't know who to ask it to. Uh, again, if the Bible addresses a subject, we will have the answer for it in the, in the text. And we'll do our very best to accommodate you and try to help you find the answers to your questions about God's Word. Hope you're studying your Bible. Most of you who, are, who watch this program, from what we have heard from feedback, you are Bible studiers. You get your Bible out, you read it. Some of you have read it through several times, and we appreciate that. You can't go wrong reading the Bible. But sometimes you hit a snag in your Bible study, and you just need some help. And we will be glad to help you with that. And uh, again, if you would like to post a Bible question or comment on any of the sites that we have, you can receive, again, a book, chapter, and verse answer. Because in the end, we have to have authority for all that we do. Why do we say book, chapter, and verse answers? Well, because there needs to be some type of authority for what we say. We just can't give you an answer and say that's just what it is and give you no proof for it. You must prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So call in tonight at 828-485-5555 and let's go through what the Bible teaches and any question that you have and any we would welcome those questions. Again, please call in. We're going to be talking in just a few moments about the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And if you would like, if you have someone in your family that is having some problems with that, if you're having issues in your own family or with your spouse about marriage issues or children issues, uh, I think this will be a particularly interesting segment for you to, to tune into. We'll just get to that in just a few minutes. But we want to get to the most important question in the world. And we deal with this at the beginning of all of our programs. And... That's what we'll be doing as long as I'm here. So we want you to know that the Bible is very clear about what must I do to be saved. You hear so many different answers to that question. You go down the street and you say, what must I do to be saved to this one? And they say, well, you don't have to do anything. God does it all. Or somebody else says, well, you just have to have faith. Or somebody else says, well, it's all in the grace of God. Or someone else will say, well, you know, you have, to, you have to work your way to heaven. And you have to do so many works and deeds of your own righteousness in order to do this. You have to give money to the poor. You have to lose some weight. You have to quit smoking. Those types of things. And there's others that tell you that all you have to do is give money to God. And he'll bless you. And he'll, he'll give you salvation if you give him enough money. Well, you know what? That's... That's just making merchandise of God's Word, and that's not true. So what does the Bible say? Again, that is the focus of this program. What does the Bible teach? What does it say? Well, the Bible says, John chapter 12 and verse 48, and we live in an area where a lot of people put great credence on what Jesus said and what, he, what, he, what the Lord himself said, and they don't want to take anything that Paul said or Peter or anybody else. So we'll just go to what Jesus says. You have your Bible? Turn to John chapter 12 and verse 48, and let's look and see what it says. John 12 and verse 48. He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. So if the words of Christ are going to judge us, if the word of the Lord is going to be our judge in the last day, don't you think we need to hear it? Faith comes by hearing. Later we find out. But Jesus says that you can, if you reject me and don't receive my words. So not receiving the words of Christ is the same as rejecting Christ. And I don't think anybody watching tonight would want to be accused of rejecting Christ, would you? So turn to John chapter 8 and verse 24. And let's see what Jesus says about belief. And that, that is the same thing, basically, as faith. He says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, you'll die in your sins. 
So does a person need to be a Christian to be saved? Jesus says so. John 14 verse 6 would also verify that. So we have to do what God says. We have to listen to what he says. And then we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he is the Messiah of prophecy. That he is the Savior of the world. He's not just a good teacher or one of many prophets. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. That he is the only one that has died to redeem our souls. So we must believe the Word of God in order to be saved. Now you don't have to believe it if you want to go to hell. You, it doesn't matter. But in Luke chapter 13 in verse 3, let's see what the Luke records about what Jesus said about repentance. Is it important for a person? We'll talk a little bit about repentance in just a few moments. And laying the groundwork on these, these things right now, we'll enter into the second segment of our program tonight. In Luke 13, 3, I tell you no, but except you repent, what? You'll all likewise perish. So repentance is absolutely essential for being saved. Don't want to be perishing. Don't want to be lost. I want to be saved, so I must repent of my sins. And in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32, Jesus says there, If you confess my name before men, I will confess yours before the Father which is in heaven. All right. And then we see also Mark 16 and verse 16, that he that is believes and is baptized shall be saved. And then in Matthew 24 and verse 13, again, let's hear some leaves rustling there in the, in the pages out there. As we turn to God's Word, chapter 24 and verse 13, He that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. So we have to, after we've been, been, been in Christ, we have to endure until the end, don't we? Revelation chapter 2.10, later Jesus says that we must be faithful unto death to receive the crown of life. So we must be faithful unto death. Does that mean that we can fall away? Yes, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 that if someone goes back into the world after having heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and turns back into the world, he's like the sow that has returned to wallowing in the mire and the dog to his own vomit. If you look through uh, all the epistles that Paul wrote, you see that he is admonishing Christians to make sure they don't fall away. John admonishes that there be no, no, nobody that falls away from the Lord. How do you fall away from someone if you were going to always be in a safe state? So you see the once saved always doctrine is not taught by Jesus. It's not taught by the apostles. It's only taught by denominations, by denominational theology. But the Bible doesn't teach it. The Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. The man that was in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that had his mother's wife, they are told to deliver him to Satan. Now he, that's a Christian. He is in their midst and he's fallen away. He's a fornicator. Now what happens in chapter in 2, Thess 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, we see there that the man repents. And he comes back to the Lord. You look at Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. Repent and pray God that the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. You're in the gall of bitterness and bond of iniquity. This is a person that's just obeyed the gospel. And he's fallen away. And he has to repent and come back. Okay? So it is possible for a sincere person that is a child of God to fall out of relationship with the Lord, to fall into sin. And he, the way for him to come back is to repent and to pray God to forgive him of his sins. If his sins are broad enough to where he has brought reproach on the church, he's supposed to repent publicly. Let that be known so that he's not labeled a hypocrite. And so the church can be the best supporters of him as he tries to overcome his sin and his fall. Well, you remember the prodigal son, when he came back, he was in the father's house, but he left. So it is today. You can leave your relationship with the Lord. You're the only one that can. But you can come back. 
And that's the good thing. You know, some people who have been taught once saved, always saved, who drift off into the world, and then they say, well, I'm, I just can't, I'm, I never was saved. Well, that's not true. If you obeyed the gospel like you're supposed to, and you fall away, you can come back always. There's always a way home, a way open. But it is through repentance and prayer for the Christian. So these are the things that are essential for your salvation. Hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, and remaining faithful unto death and receiving the crown that God has in mind for all of us. I want to ask a question tonight as we go through our charts this evening. The name of the lesson tonight will basically be, have you been converted? Now most people would say, well, I've, certainly I've been changed, or Jesus came into my life at this point, or the Holy Spirit spoke to me out in the field one day, and so I've been changed, I've been converted. But we're going to examine that tonight, and we're going to look at the word conversion in just a few minutes and see what it says. But before we get into that, I do want you, if you will, to go to, with, you, with me in your Bibles, and let's look at a passage, look at a few passages. The question was asked of me, what does the Bible say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? What is the Bible position? Not what does man say, because man will give you a divorce for any reason, or for no reason at all. Just if you don't like the way they cook the bread, you can divorce your spouse in our society. And we call it irreconcilable differences, things such as that. But again, we want to go by what the book says, and let's look and see what's in the book. Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Matthew 19, and let's read what Jesus said about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Who has a right to marry? If you're married to someone who cheated on their spouse, you better get out of that relationship because you don't have a right to them. They're a fornicator. And you don't have a right to be with them, according to what Jesus said. The Pharisees, in verse 3, came unto him and tempted him, and said this, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he that made them at the beginning made them male and female? Well, he starts off talking about what constitutes a marriage, and he says it, it demands a male and a female. Not a male and a male, not a female and a female, but a male and a male, a male and a female, I'm sorry. So there is no authority in the scripture from Jesus for homosexual relationships. So that's why it ran out the window in verse 4. All right, and he said, answered and said to them, have you not read this? And then he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to who? To his wife. And they, he and his wife, shall be one flesh. And they are no more two, but they are one. What therefore God has joined together, let not man divide or put asunder. So God says that Two people who have never been married can get married. He also says that someone whose spouse has died can marry someone else who has a right to remarry or to marry someone who has never married. They have that right because, and we'll read that in just a moment. And he also says that the innocent party in a divorce that was severed because of fornication that the one innocent of that fornication can marry. Question comes up, well suppose both have cheated against one another. They only have a right to one another if they're going to be married. They don't have a right to get away and go marry whoever they want to. Someone says, well, you know, does God want people not to get married? Some people. Some people. He goes on and says that. They said, then why did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? And he said, Moses, because the hardness of hearts suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, verse 9, here it is, that whoever shall put away his wife, except, that word except means if and only if, 
the only reason, the only exception for fornication and shall marry another commits adultery. And whoever marries her put away does commit adultery. Now watch what his disciples say. His disciples said if this is the case with the man with his wife, it's good not to marry at all. Well, that may be the course that some choose is not to ever marry. But Jesus says to them, all men cannot receive this saying, save those to whom it is given. Now he's not saying it's a take it or leave it proposition. He's just saying that everybody is not going to abide by this. But they were not in relationship to God if they don't, you see. For there are some, he, look at what he says here, there are some who have been eunuchs and born this way from their mother's womb. And there are some that are eunuchs that have made themselves eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. He that hath is able to receive it, let him receive it. What he says there is some people have chosen to live a celibate life for the kingdom's sake because they don't want their soul to be lost. Now is that a high price to pay? Yes and no. In relationships here it is, but in your relationship eternally, oh my, you gain so much more, don't you? So which is most important, relationships here or a relationship with God eternally? You see, it costs some people more to be Christians than it does others. A person can be forgiven of any sin they commit, but there are consequences to some sins. And to sever a marriage bond, to involve yourself in fornication with somebody, and to break the trust that, you, that God placed in both of you when he put you together in marriage, that's a major deal. And God does not take that sin lightly. It is a sin like all other sins and must be repented of and must be atoned for by the blood of Christ. But there are consequences to our sins. And a, a person does not have to stay married to someone who has cheated on them. And so it's important that we understand that. Well, let's look at, Ro at Romans chapter 7 since we're going through what Jesus said. In Romans chapter 7, we see the duration of marriage. How long is a marriage binding between a man and a woman? Can we just decide one day we want to walk away from it? Well, not according to what Romans chapter 7 teaches. Let's look there and see. A woman, verse 2, that hath a husband is bound by the law to that husband as long as he lives. But if her husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. For then if, if while her husband lives she would marry to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law, so that she is no more, no, not an adulteress, though she is married to another man. Okay? So marriage is how long? One man, one woman, until what? Until death. That's the natural relationship. And that's what God wants. Now how should one treat their spouse in marriage? We're, going to, we're talking about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And again, that's, that's what God says and what we just covered there. That's what God said about divorce and remarriage. And again, we want to stress the guilty party has no right to remarry. None. Somebody says, that's awful harsh. Well, you have your argument with God because we just read you the passages. And somebody says, well, what about little children? Well, they are the victims all the time in a divorce. And that's why God hates divorce. Now, can two people, even if you've been cheated against, somebody, if your spouse has, has violated your trust, can you build that marriage back together? Yes, you can. And if you would like to build your marriage back together, you call me, call this station, call one of the operators, and we'll come talk to you and do what we can to help you remain whole in your marriage relationship if it is one that is lawful. 
If it's unlawful, we'll read you what the scriptures say, and then you take it from there. Because that's that you've got to, if you want to go to heaven, friends, we've got to abide by all that what God says. Now, some people get themselves in a mess, absolutely. There are some people that probably can't remember all the women they've been with and all the different marriages they've had. But the fact is, that's somebody making a travesty of marriage. That's not what God wants. He wants one man, one woman, until death separates them. Well, how, how, does a home, how is a home supposed to work? Well, a home needs to be constituted and made up of a husband and a wife. Okay? Look, if you will, in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. You got your Bibles? It's here the leaves rustling. Okay? Ephesians chapter 5, 21 where he tells Christians here to submit themselves to one another in the fear of God. Submission is something that a lot of people need to learn. A lot of men need to learn it. Women and men. Because submission is essential to being a Christian. If you can't learn to submit to God, then you won't submit to anybody or anything. You won't submit to government. You won't submit to your spouse. You won't submit to your brethren. And it's very important we understand that. So submission and humility, just essential. And then he addresses wives in verse 22, chapter 5 of Ephesians. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, as if to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You see that? Who is supposed to be in charge of the home? Who is the leader of the home? The husband. Now is that true in all cases? No. Some husbands are, are not doing their job. They're letting their wives run the house. And they're encouraging that. So you look at this and you see here the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. There's a protection that Christ gives to the church that a husband is to give to his family. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, verse 24, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. And understood, that's everything that is lawful and right. Your husband has no right to tell you to do something that is sinful. You don't have to obey that. You obey God first. Then you're looking at verse 25, to husbands. Here he tells husbands, you love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. See the submission there? He is willing to give himself for his family, for his wife. He's to love her that much that he would die for her. And he will give himself, his life to her. And she will never ever wonder whether he loves her or not. She will know that because of the way he treats her. He loves her as Christ loved the church. And then he goes on, he says, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. So again, love for your spouse is essential. Submission as a wife to your husband is essential. Husbands being the head of the house and the leader of the home is essential spiritually and every other way. So ought men to love their wives. He that loves his wife loves himself. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, verse 29, but he nourishes it and he cherishes it, even as the Lord does the church. And then he says in verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Let every one of you so love his wife, verse 33, as himself, and let the wife see that she honors or reverences her husband. Now, in order for two people to act like this, do you think they need to have anything spiritual going on in their home? Friends, if you're trying to have a marriage relationship that is according to what God wants it to be, and that's the happiest relationship on this earth between two people, if you're trying to do that without a spiritual base, you're always going to be cheating yourself from what you could have. And you'll never understand it until you have a 
common relationship in Christ. So many people start out their homes and start out their marriages and they've got uh, passion involved or they've got uh, this, that, or the things involved and that t those types of things, but they never, ever think about the spiritual. The Bible says that the spiritual things are absolutely essential for the proper functioning of the home. Why would a husband love his wife? Well, the, to the person that has a spiritual base, a Bible base, he does it because Christ said so. Why would a wife submit herself to her husband? Because Christ said so. Why would they do that if they don't believe in Christ? They don't believe in the Bible. You see how that would make your marriage limp right from the beginning? See? Now marriage relationships are binding. Marriage is binding whether someone's a Christian or not. You don't get the, the option to say, well I married my spouse before I was a Christian and now I've learned better and I'm going to put them away. No, don't get to do that. It's a marriage, it's a marriage goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So, that's what the Bible says about how a man is to treat his wife and how a wife is to treat her husband. And if children come into the world, look at Ephesians 6. And let's see how children are supposed to behave. Parents are to raise their children to obey the Lord. And in doing that, they are to train them to obey their parents. Children, command of God, by the way, chapter 6, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Parents are put here and children are given to a man and a wife so that they might be blessed to raise that children, that child up in the ways of God. Watch the rest of this. Honor your father and your mother, children, which is the first commandment with promise that it might be well with you and that you might live long on this earth. And ye fathers, verse 4, do not provoke your children to wrath. Don't urge them to evil. But you bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Okay, so fathers are commanded to raise up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Are you doing that, parents? Or do your children run the house? Are the children running the mom and dad or are the parents training the children you see we live in a society where it is almost impossible to raise children like God says but God says if you love your child you will discipline them now that doesn't always involve spanking but it does include that several different ways to discipline and you need to tell someone if they're going the wrong way God disciplines his children. Hebrews tells us if we don't discipline our children, we don't love them. So there are boundaries that need to be set, just like God sets boundaries for us because he loves us, not because he hates us, but because he doesn't want us to lose our soul with our children. We don't want them to get hurt. So we set up boundaries, and we demand that they go by those rules. We're at a point now in our society where people almost think it's mean for somebody to say, if you live in my house, you live by my rules. But that's exactly what a, a father has a right to say to his children. In this house, we serve God. And he leads his family in that uh, venture. He's the one that is a spiritual leader of the home. Fathers, does that describe you? We just went through Father's Day. What are your kids going to remember about you? That they had to be quiet because you're sleeping off a drunk and you get real irritable? When it comes time for, for church time, dad goes fishing or goes hunting? Is that what the situation is? Well, ask yourself that. Fathers, what do you want your children to remember about you? Dad raised me to serve God. And I'm so glad he did. Or dad raised me to be a drunk. Or to take drugs. Or to steal. Or to gamble. Dad taught me how to drink. Oh my. What a memory. 
That'd be horrible, wouldn't it? But that's sadly what some children are learning. I learned how to cuss from my daddy. Is that what you want your children to learn? Hope not. You know, our society has kind of gotten things backwards. We have dads that are macho in every way, it seems like. But we do not have a presentation that a man can be a godly man and be, and be a, a real man. Because that's the only kind of real man there is, friends. God's man. Does that describe you? If you're watching tonight and you're a man, are you God's man? Can your family count on you to serve the Lord? Do you lead your family in the paths of the Lord? Are you shepherding your family like you should? Or are you just letting them do whatever they want to? Are you the type of man that a woman, your wife, can look up to and respect and love because of your relationship with the Lord? Again, I don't care what society says constitutes a real man. The Lord says a man that loves him and is humble and loves his wife, loves his children, and takes control and raises them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's God's man. That's a real man. So think about these things, and we hope the question has been answered sufficiently. But again, going back to marriage, marriage can be involved. You can have two people that have never been married. You can have a person who is a widow or a widower. And then you have a person that can marry who, has, who is the innocent party in a, in a divorce situation where the other spouse committed fornication against them. You can't marry somebody that has been divorced because they just got divorced. So you have no right to marry someone like that. And a person that's in that relationship can't marry, you see. So marriage is a privilege, and we must honor it. Even if our society has walked away from honoring it, we must honor what God says. Now, we read it to you, folks. And you need to make sure that your family, that you read it to your children. And you, you get it in their heads that they don't get to just pick and choose and trade husbands and wives like, they do, like people do cars or SUVs or boats. You know, you, you have one man and one woman for life. You better choose carefully. And you better make sure that once you have worked hard to get that relationship sealed in marriage, that you don't ignore it, that you don't take it for granted. My wife and I have been married over 43 years. And I'll tell you what, it's been work. More work on her part than me. But again, you look at what it takes, it takes work to sustain a relationship. Rather than working to tear your relationship apart, why don't you put that energy into trying to sustain the relationship? Husbands, bring your wife some flowers. You can, get, you can pick one out of the yard and bring her to her. You know? Just something that simple. Do something nice, remember the special days. And don't let her have to buy her own anniversary present, you know, or her own cards. Do, this, do the little things. And I tell you what, if you do the little things, the big things will take care of themselves. But you make sure that you do those little things because they mean so much to a woman particularly. And women, don't belittle your husband. And don't put them down and try to, do, try to walk on them in front of other people. They're the one you chose to spend your life with. Honor them. Submit to them. And know this, that they want you to go to heaven. Husbands, help one another. Help your wife go to heaven. And wives, help your husband go to heaven. And the two of you, help your children do the same. Again, that's God on marriage on divorce and on remarriage. If we can help you with anything related to these types of things, please call in and we'll do what we can to instruct you from God's Word. We are not marriage counselors. You may have some problems that you need to deal with that need professional help and that's certainly not our, our situation. 
but we can point you to what the Bible says about how to have a happy marriage. We can, we can sure do that. We can find the passages that will tell you how to have a good relationship with your spouse. Now, whether you do it or not, it's up to you. So again, thank you so much for listening to this portion of our program. I'll take a little break and just remind you that you can call in and ask for our Bible correspondence course, and we would urge you to do that. Now, we're getting, going to get into conversions. Now, what does the term conversion mean? In Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, notice here, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The jailer asked that. What must I do to be saved? What was he told? Let's look and see. The word convert means to change or to turn. Look at the chart here. To change or to turn. There are three things involved in the process of one turning from sin to God. The first one is a change of heart. The heart of the mind can only be changed through faith. And faith comes by, do, by doing what? By hearing the word of God. So the Bible teaches that people's hearts are purified by faith. Acts 15 and verse 9. And in other words, when one learns from the Bible about the love of God that he has toward us and the sacrifice of Jesus for us, we are moved to repent. And repentance and conversion are terms that go hand in hand. They are twin terms. When one changes his mind about God and Jesus and sin, he will have a different relationship. This is by Raymond Harris. He wrote this back in 1986. A change of life comes as a result of repentance. Change of heart leads to a change of life. Isn't that natural? If you're going to change what is important to you, then you change your way of life. You live a different life. Note Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of Christians, and then he became Paul the Apostle a special vessel that God set out for the Gentiles to teach them. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of life. So we see the evolution of conversion as a result of faith produced by the Word of God. Man is led to repent. So faith leads us to repent. And repentance leads us to confess that Jesus is the Son of God and confession. All of that leads us to be baptized in water for the remission of our sins. Obedience to what God has said is what the changed heart wants to do. It comes to God naked and says, I will do whatever you please. Please tell me what to do. I have heard your word. I believe it. I love your son and I admit that he's the son of God. I'm willing to change the way I live and let the word of God be my guide in all things. I'm ready to pledge my allegiance to Jesus Christ and live for him the rest of my life and put myself to death. That's a change, isn't it? That's a conversion. And conversion demands a change of relationship. So when I have done these things, what is my relationship with God now? There's two types of accountable people in the world today. There's the wicked and the righteous. There's the children of the devil and the children of God. And no one can be translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God without a change of heart that works, that works into a change of life and an obedient submission to God. In order, the reason you do that is because you have remission of sins. When one's sins are forgiven, he enters a state of relationship with God that is personal. It is close. You are with your father. You have been estranged from him, but you are with him now. Baptism in Acts 2 and verse 38 is that one act that puts us into Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How do I put, how am I in Christ? I put him on in baptism. What kind of baptism? Water baptism. Well, 
The converted are buried with Christ in baptism, Romans 6, and they are raised to walk a new life. So my whole world changes when I'm a converted person. I'm not dragging in old things. I'm not holding on to the past and bringing in my favorite sins with me. I have turned my back on those things. I'm, I'm trying to run as far from those as I can, not try to bring them with me. That's true conversion, friends. So we ask the question, have you been converted? As the Bible speaks of it. Because anything short of what we've just mentioned is not true Bible conversion. There are a lot of people who are sincere and honest that think they've been converted. But have you examined whether you've been biblically converted or not? That's the important thing. Have you been biblically converted? Not have you been converted to satisfy what a church says or what some men say or what grandma and granddad say or mom and daddy. Have you truly been converted to Jesus Christ? Have you been baptized in water for the remission of your sins? It's been said, and Mr. Harris said this, he says, faith changes the heart. Repentance changes the life. And baptism changes the relationship to God. One's sins are not forgiven merely because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior or because we quit committing sins. Sins are only forgiven by God when we complete our conversion in the act of baptism. So we ask ourselves the question, have you been truly converted? Fully converted, as the Bible speaks of it. And then let's go in and let's look and see what the Bible says is truly, conver truly conversion. It's always good to look up a word and see what it means if we're going to discuss it. So let's go to the authority on words. Let's go to a dictionary and let's see what the dictionary says. And here's the chart. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says this about convert or converted. Go ahead and go to the chart, if you will. The word convert or converted is a transitive verb. Number one definition is to bring over from one belief view or party to another. To bring about a religious conversion and then the second definition is to alter the physical or chemical nature or properties, especially in manufacturing. To change from one form or function to another. To alter for more effective utilization. You see how conversion in all cases, in all the definitions, one and two on this, all of them are talking about a, con a change. Something changes, doesn't it? To bring over from one belief to another or party to another. To bring about a religious conversion in, to change. When we go to Vine's complete expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words, the original word for convert or, con or convert or converted is strepo. And that is a verb and it means to turn to be converted, to turn. It actually comes from a military term which involves itself in, a, in that same type of thing as an about face. You're walking in one direction and you wheel around and you go the other direction. All right, you're walking the wrong way and you turn and walk eagerly the right way. So it is a turning. It is a turning. To be converted is to turn. Also, to turn oneself, all right? They turned back in their hearts unto Egypt, okay? They, were, they converted their hearts to go back to Egypt, and that's the wrong connotation. In Acts 7 and verse 39, to turn oneself from one's course of conduct to change one's mind. But it is not simply a change of mind. Conversion is not just a change of mind. Repentance is not just a change of mind. It is a change of mind that moves to a change of life. Well, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3 and 4. And Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, 
unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see anything about this sweet little girl pictured here? She just looks innocent, doesn't she? She looks just as sweet and innocent and pure as she can be, and she is. There's not a sin in this child's life right now. So you look at that and you see that. And the Lord says, unless you be like this child, what does he mean? He doesn't mean that we need to retard our mental capacity. He says, I just want you to recognize that you, as a child is trusting, as a child is pure and right with me, you are to be that way too. You must be converted and become like a little child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now friends, there are so many things that go on in someone's life to make them everything but what God wants them to be. But Jesus says here, he says, you have to become like a little child. What is there about a little child that I need to become like? I need to become innocent. I need to become pure. I need to become, my focus needs to be on the things of God, the one that leads me. I am totally vulnerable and submissive as a child. Children are given us as a great blessing and they trust us and there is great trust in a child. There's great forgiveness in a child. You know, another child pushes them or something like that and they say, I'm sorry, and the child turns immediately and says, okay, that's okay, let's play. That's children, that's not adults, <laughs> you know. Well, adults want to get in a fight about that, okay? But not the child. So we've got to recognize we need to become like little children in our conversion. Well, to turn about, to turn towards. All right, causing a person to turn, James 5, 19 and 20. We are to make sure that we turn to what God wants us to do. All right, have you done, done that? Have you turned to where God wants you to be? Not where you want to be, but where God wants you to be. In James 5, 19, he says there, Brethren, if any of you errs from the truth, and one converts him, does that word convert? Let him know that he that converts a sinner from the error of his way saves the soul from death and hides or prevents a multitude of sin. Okay? To turn them again. Okay? To change them. He's talking in this context about Christians that have fallen. And turning them back again. Converting them again. Okay? Bringing them back to the right way. So the term convert or convert can mean that and does mean that. In Acts 3 in verse 19, the writer there says, repent therefore and be converted. Repent and what? Be converted. You see how repentance and conversion go together? And the reason you do this is so your sins can be blotted out. And so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When does that come? when you repent and you are truly changed like God says not like man says but like God says so again let him know that he that turns or converts a sinner from the error of his way saves that soul from death and prevents or covers a multitude of sins okay. well the term convert also means a turning around in Acts 15 and verse 3, a turning from and a turning to. So again, not just turning away from something, but turning towards something else. That's what Vine's definition allows. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10, and look at the chart if you will, we see here that there, are, there were people spoken of, at the Thessalonians. He says, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn that word turn is converted how you converted to God from idols what did you do you turned away from idols you turned toward God right you see that 
And so you turned to God so that you could serve the living and the true God, not serve the idols. And so you could wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers him from the wrath to come. You see how this man's chopping down the idol? He's turning away from the idol and turning toward God, you see. He doesn't want anything else to do with idolatry. He's destroying it out of his life. He doesn't want to turn back into it. His focus now is the Lord and serving him. That's conversion. So conversion is not just a change in actions. In Luke 15, verses 11 through 24, one of the most touching passages in the Bible is there. It's the story that you know and that I know as the prodigal son. All right, now the prodigal son story, if you have your Bibles, let's turn over there and let's look at that. And let's just read what happened. You have a man that has two sons. One is very sanctimonious, and one basically thinks that he has never done anything wrong. And the other one is just an absolute reprobate. Notice chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Give me my portion of goods that falls to me. So his father divided the things among him. Not many days after, the younger son gathered everything together and took his journey into a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent everything, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of the country who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And we, he, he would have longed to have filled his belly with the husk that the swines were eating, but no man would give them unto him. But when he came to himself, here's a change. You see the change? When he came to himself, what happened? He said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I'm perishing here with hunger. He's having a heart-to-heart -heart talk with himself. What am I doing here? How did I get to this point where I want to eat hog food? And he's beginning the process of changing. He says, I, and now he has a plan. I'm going to arise, and I'm going to go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Is he sorry? Is he penitent? Yes, but has he accomplished this yet? Nope. All it is now is a plan. And he arose, and he came to his father. But even while he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son follows through. Watch his, see his follow through. The son says to the father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm not even worthy any more to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry, for my son was lost, or was dead, and now is alive. He was lost, and now he's found. Let's rejoice. Now this prodigal son, friends, did not just come back and, or did not just plan to come back or have a good idea. He followed through on it. He realized he was wrong. He admitted he was wrong. And he was coming back. Now at what point was he in right relationship with the father? Was it when he admitted that he was in the wrong place? No. Was it when he planned to make the changes? No. When he just had good intentions? No. The full conversion, the full change, the full repentance came when he not only turned his back on what he was doing, but he turned toward what he was doing that was right and came and asked the forgiveness of his father for what he had done. Not merely a change of action or a good plan, 
but a follow through. Change in knowledge. He'd been thinking about the world. Now he's thinking about the Lord. A change in conviction? Yeah. Now he wants to serve his father again. He wants to come back to where he left, where he had it so good. And how much is this like up many times people today? You think you got it made somewhere else. Grass is always greener somewhere else. This boy realized he had it pretty good where he was. He had everything he needed. This boy changed his thinking. He changed his will. He was converted and he changed his commitment, resulting in a change in relationship and identity. Now he is back in relationship. He's not anymore a hog, a hog farmer. He's going back to his daddy's house in full relationship again, even though he's, he was ready to receive a lower position and be happy there. Is a change. Conversion, friends, is a change in who we are, in how we talk, where we go, what we do, how we dress. All of these things are involved in true conversion. And anything short of these things is not Bible conversion. You see, you just can't have a good idea. You just can't have, well, I'm going to one day. You have to have a commitment that says, I will do what's right. And I'll do it because it's right. Not because somebody's making me. Not because I got caught and I need to make the law think that I'm sincere. No, you change because your heart is turned by the word of God to what is right. Okay? Now, in order to be converted properly, I have to hear the proper way to be converted, don't I? I've got to know what the right way is. How am I going to change if I don't know the right way? In John 8 and verse 32, Jesus says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It is the truth, friends, Jesus says, that sets man free. Not something else. Not a bigger car, not a bigger house. All that does is get you more stressed because you have to pay for them. What really makes you have a substantive change is when you know the truth and you value the truth and you care what Jesus says and what God has taught in his word. The real gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 15, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel that I preach unto you, that ye received and wherein ye stand, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory what is preached to you, unless you believe it in vain. So the real gospel. Romans 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. What was preached in the book of Acts to all the converts, the people that obeyed the gospel? Yet the gospel was preached. The message of Jesus Christ was taught to them. And it moved them to change their behaviors. Friends, that's how powerful the word of God is. It'll move the most stubborn heart if it's allowed its place in that heart. So I must receive the correct information. You can't be taught error and believe error and obey error and somehow say that you have been converted to the Lord. You have to have the right truth. Do you believe in that, that it is the truth? Matthew 15 and verse 14. So you can't be taught wrong and end up right, can you? You have to somewhere along the line hear the truth. And Paul says that I preach to you the gospel by which you are saved. So it is through the gospel of Jesus Christ that we find out the message of Jesus Christ that saves us, moves us to obedience. 
right? So we learn these things, receiving the correct information. Well, when I receive the right information, I'm faced with a choice. Do I believe it or do I not? I'm hearing the right information, but am I believing it? You see? Now, it's impossible to please God without faith, Hebrews 1, or Hebrews 11, verses 1 and verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe he is and that he is a rewarder of those who watch this diligently seek him. So I'm seeking the Lord. I'm trying to do the right thing. But I've got to come to a change in my life. Something that moves me to change. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. All right. Do you believe the word of God? Do you hear it? Not do you audibly hear it. But do you hear what the Lord is telling you? Through his word. Now I'm not talking about the Lord whispering in your ear. Or the spirit floating around and giving you some message. Because it is through the Bible. And aren't you glad it is? We don't have to come up with some experience that says God called me. We're called through the gospel, friends. All of us the same way. Some of you that are watching tonight have been in churches where you have been told that you are not truly saved. God's not really happy with you until you've had your second work of grace. And some of you have been waiting on that for years, haven't you? And you're honest enough to say it hasn't happened yet. Well, you know why? Because you don't get your call out in the field when the Lord whispers in your ear when you look up in a cloud and see Jesus or look in a phone pole and see Jesus. You get your call when you listen to the gospel. You don't get it by looking at a taco and saying there's a picture of Jesus. That's not where it comes from. Because it'd be different for everybody. How come some people see Jesus and others don't? Jesus isn't a respecter of persons. But he calls all of us through the gospel. And guess what? We can all read it. And we can all understand it. And we are all called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith comes not from an experience. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. This is the sword of the spirit. That divides to the cutting asunder of joint and marrow. The Hebrew writer tells us. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And when we follow this word, God's roadmap to heaven, when we follow it, we'll be changed when we give it our right pl the right place in our lives. Well, what type of conviction do you have? Did anything change in your life when you became a child of God? If you haven't changed or anything, if there's no change in your conviction, all you are is just to... A Christian or a sinner that thinks they're saved but has never proved it. Who God is, what he does for us, who is God? Acts 17, the unknown God they were worshiping there in Athens. That's the one Paul wants to declare. He's the one that made everything. And we have life through him. He loved us, John 3, 16, enough to die for us. And Jesus is the only way to salvation. Who is Jesus? What has he done for us? He's died for our sins. He has emptied himself, Philippians chapter 2, and took on the form of a man. And he thought although he was on equality with God, it was nothing to be grasped. But he emptied himself and became and took on the flesh of men. He submitted himself to his creation. That's what he did for us. Now friends, you hear that message and you listen to what God has done for us and what through and through Christ. And you're moved to ask a question, what do I need to do? We find out the questions that people are all the time asking, the basic questions every soul longs to know. Who am I? What am I doing here? Where am I going? And all the and two or three more different different questions too. The Bible answers all of them. What must I do to be saved? What must you do to be saved? You don't know where in the Bible. These are things you will not hear in the Bible. 
Accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Invite him into your life and say the sinner's prayer. And I'll venture to say that many of you who are watching tonight, that's exactly what you base your salvation on, although it is never found in God's Word. Where did it come from? You've heard it and you've obeyed it, but it's not from the Bible. So if it's not from the Bible, can it be a valid way to salvation if we're called through the gospel? No. We have to have book, chapter, and verse for what we're doing, don't we? Authority. Otherwise, it's just a, something we decided to do because somebody told us. Well, why did people tell you that if it's not found in the Bible? Because they were taught it. How many people have really gone back and checked into what they believe? And why they believe it. It's amazing how many people will believe something and they have no idea where they got it. I had an uncle that my dad says would have just as soon told a lie when the truth was facing him right in the face. Well, he'd tell some yarns, as my dad said. He'd tell some big old yarns. Well, you know what? He got to where he believed those yarns so much he could convince you to believe them. You know what? That's what some religions are doing today. They have taught error so long that they really believe it. And they try to teach you error. And you believe them so the process continues. Nobody ever stops, and sometimes some people do, they step, step back and say, wait a minute, where did this come from? Where are these ideas? I'm looking in my Bible and I don't see anybody ever saved like that. Well, okay. That's the wise person that stops and says, time out, where's the Bible proof for this? Friends, question your preachers. Ask them where they got the Bible, where in the Bible this practice or that practice that you involve yourself in, where is it? Prove all things and hold on to what's good. And what's good is what's found in the book. Again, if we would all go back to the Bible for our authority and throw away all of our different ideas, we'd all be, be so much better off. We'd be right, get right with God. So how do I change my will? You ever seen anybody that's just stubborn? That's the pride of life. So how do I get rid of this pride of life? There's something I have to do. Luke 15, remember? The young man says, I must go back to my father. I must change my will. Now remember, that boy was walking home hungry. He'd wanted to eat hog food. He, had, he walked home on an empty stomach. And he was thirsty. But he went home. It was hard for him. And so it is with all people. It's hard sometimes to change your will to really want to change. Have you ever tried to lose weight only to realize that you really aren't committed to it? Maybe you want to lose 10 pounds to go to the graduation. Maybe you want to lose 10 pounds to get married and get in the wedding dress or the tuxedo. But you really don't want to continue to keep that 10 pounds off or you would. So when do you get to the point where you say, I'm going to change my lifestyle. I'm going to not make losing weight a fad. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to put the right things into my body. That's a lifestyle change. And that's the only way that you'll ever get over the idea of chasing the, the weight charts. And in the same way, only when you decide to make Christianity and serving the Lord your lifestyle will you ever make any substantive changes in it. Things that mean something. That's when you go to the Bible and not look at the Bible as some fad, something you do occasionally, some pastime, some neat idea, some hobby, but it is who you are. You have made this Bible live within you. And you have changed your will. You've let the Word of God change you. And continue to change you. 
Repentance requires a radical change. In Ezekiel 18, we are told to tell people what they're supposed to do to change. If we don't tell them, it's on us for not telling them. It's on them for not obeying, but it's on us for not telling them. Repentance requires a radical change. He sees him sin in Ezekiel 18, and he turns from his sin. And he is forgiven of his sin. Who did that? Well, the person that told him, no, God did that. But he did it through you. You took that message to them. You ever found it interesting that God chose to communicate his word through people like me, like you, and like others who are Christians, who go around and try to tell people what the Bible says. We're fallible. We're just people like everybody else. But we found something. And we cannot be quiet about it. And we're going to tell it to everyone we can, as long as we can, where we can. That's what has that attitude in Acts chapter 4. We cannot help but say the things and teach the things that we've seen and heard. We've got a great message. We've got the cure for spiritual cancer. And we need to let the world know about it. You know about the Lord? You know about what the Word of God teaches? If you don't, and you'd like to know, you call, pardon me, you call one of our operators right now, and we will be glad to set up a class and come out and tell you what you need to do from the Bible. And if we just get, to get out there and start telling you something we think, you can put us in the car and send us home. But if we're telling you what the Bible says, you listen to it. You're going to have to do something with it. The Word of God is the means by which we are changed. God wants us to do something. There's a lot of people that think that, that, that almost start laughing at you when you say that God wants us to do something. But turn to Romans chapter 2 and verses 3 through 6. Turn there if you will. Romans 2 and verses 3 through 6. Thinkest thou, O man, that judgest them which do so such things and does the same, that you'll escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? God wants you to do something. He wants you to change, doesn't he? Notice he goes on, but after their hardness and impenitent heart, they treasure up against themselves wrath in the day of wrath. God will render to every man according to what? His deeds. You know what a deed is? It's something you do. We do wicked deeds or we do righteous deeds. But it is all action, isn't it? We do something. And the Lord wants us to do something. He doesn't just want us to do anything. He doesn't just accept any old thing from us. But if we love him, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. That's doing something, isn't it? 2 Peter 3, verse 9, if you will. He says, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should what? Come to repentance. Is coming to repentance an act? Is it a work? It is. Coming to repentance is a work. It's a work of God that he has commanded. But he has put it upon all men to do it. And so when your friends and your preacher tell you that you don't have to do anything, that there's no such thing as work salvation, you tell them that's just wrong. Romans 2 and 2 Peter 3 say that, that it is work. There is some works involved. But it's the works of God. You can't be saved without doing God's works, friends. And you can't invent your own way to go to heaven. That's a system of works that is not authorized. But you better mighty well do what God says in order to go to heaven because he sent his son to die for you. 
And you're obeying him when you do that. Well, a change of will involves an acknowledgement that what you were doing is the wrong way. A recognition of that, acknowledgement of sin, remorse or regret and grieving over your sins. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those that mourn, that doesn't mean those that go to funerals. He's talking there primarily about those that mourn over the sad state of their soul. And that's the only thing that will actually bring us where we need to be. Now, of course, there's a secondary application. It's good for us to mourn and come to the house of mourning. We understand that. But the primary application of that is he's talking about those that are sorry over their sins. Then I have to have a resolve. That's a change of mind, a change of my will. And that leads to a reformed lifestyle, a change in who I am. And that's noticeable to my friends, and they wonder when they look at us and wonder, what happened to you? Well, I'm a Christian. I don't do those things anymore. Oh, so you found God. Yep, sure did. And he's not far from you. And you need to find him too, because he's not lost. You are, but he's not. He's there for everybody. And then the restitution. Well, I want you to look at this chart for just a moment, and I want to, I want to ask you if, if it looks familiar to you. You see those recognition, remorse, resolve, reformation, and restitution? Look familiar? Have you ever looked at the 12-step program of the alcoholics and the Naradon people? You have to acknowledge that you've got a problem. You have to be sorry about it. And you have to have a, remind, a resolved mind that you're going to change your, the way you're doing. And then you've got to do it. And then you have to make restitution. Make amends. Go around and heal relationships. Do something. See? Make amends as far as possible. You've been doing wrong, sinning. And if you could do something about that, if you stole $10 from somebody, go give it back to them if you can. That's what's involved, friends. Well, then I have a change of allegiance. I'm not serving myself anymore. In Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, there's a man called the eunuch. He was a treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. He is a proselyte Jew. And so we have a change of allegiance. This man, when he was converted, was still a treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. So his allegiance politically was to Ethiopia. But boy, was he a changed man in other ways. He was not serving himself anymore. He had been told the old law was over. And now you don't have to travel to Jerusalem anymore. And as a eunuch, guess what? You couldn't go into the temple. But now, guess what? As a Christian, you're just as equal with everybody else as, as you can be. Allegiance. Well, we have a pledge of allegiance, don't we? We used to say it every morning at school. I, so, I hope we still do. I hope every school still does that. But raising the flag, we pledge allegiance to the United States. But I tell you what, if the United States falls apart, we have pledged allegiance to God, haven't we? The term allegiance means to declare openly by way of speaking out freely, and particularly in religion, speaking the things that deeply affect our conviction in Christ conveys the thought of confessing allegiance to the Lord as one's master and as his Lord. This is Vine's word study that says this. So I am convicted on the facts, so moved that I have said I will no longer be in allegiance to myself. I'll no longer serve just myself. I will above all serve my Lord. And he has my first the first place in my life. I will crown him king, 
and I will submit to him in all that I do. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, we talked about this. Whoever confesses me before men, him I also will confess before my Father. But whoever denies me before men, him will I deny also before my Father. When the eunuch asked, what must I do? Here's water, what shall we do? Can I be baptized? He was told, yes, you can, but you have something you haven't done yet. You haven't confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe, you can. And so he confessed what he believed, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. By saying that, friends, you're saying no one else is. There is no one else that can save my soul but Jesus Christ. His blood was shed on the cross for my sins. I am willing to become his slave and he to become my master. And I will serve my master faithfully all the days of my life. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, this change of allegiance is, again, something that's verbal. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Jesus raised, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made, watch this, unto salvation. You see those untos there? Confession is unto. All right. And we see there that that, is, that leads us unto Christ, but does not put us into Christ. So, now what do we do? Well, I have a change in my commitment, and it starts by being buried in water in baptism heard the story of Jesus and I know that he died and that he was buried and that he arose. And Romans chapter 6 teaches exactly that for all of us to do. Friends, if anyone tells you that baptism isn't essential to salvation, they're lying to you. Romans chapter 6. Somebody says, well, what about people that hadn't been baptized? Well, what does the Bible say? If I put Christ on in baptism and I haven't been baptized, am I in Christ? No. Have I been, can I be saved outside of Christ? No. So how many chances have you had to be baptized? How old are you? How many days have you had? So whose fault is it if you're not baptized for the remission of your sins? It's certainly not God's. He's not willing that you perish. But a number of reasons why people aren't baptized, sometimes they, they believe they're, they're preachers. Or they believe their theology of their church and they don't read the Bible. I want you to read Romans 6, verse 3, and 6, 3 through 6. Got your Bible? Let's read it. He says, Know ye not that so many of you as were baptized into Christ? There it is. We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with Christ by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Our old man is crucified with him, and the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. If we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. So, do you have to be baptized to be saved? Could there be salvation if Christ didn't die? Could there be salvation if Christ was not raised? No. Could there be salvation if Christ wasn't buried in the tomb? Nope. Because all that would have been just words, wouldn't it? But all that did happen. And so there is salvation in Christ. How do I get into Christ? I'm baptized into Christ. 
Jesus died, was buried, and arose for me. I die, I'm buried, and I arise to walk a new life for him. That's what he asks. That's what Paul teaches in Romans chapter, chapter 6 and verse 3 through 6. United with Christ in his death. Where would I reach that death? Where does that blood apply to me? In his death. So I submit to his authority. I receive remission of sins when I do that. Remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told to do what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Does the water give us remission of sins? No, but the blood does. And it's received in the waters of baptism. That's where in the death of Christ where we find that. And so baptism is a likeness of all that. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus because as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When do I put on Christ? In baptism. Am I close to Christ when I've heard, believed, repented and confessed? Oh, absolutely. That's all essential. But you've not closed the deal, friends, until you're baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Now you can call that water dog salvation. You can call that whatever you want to. It's Bible. If you want to make fun of the Bible, go ahead. And you answer for it. But it's what the Bible says, friends. And I'm, if you want me to change that, you're talking to the wrong guy. Because that's not going to be found. When the Bible changes, I'll change. But it's not going to be changed. We have the scriptures for us today. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21, what does Peter say? Just as in the days of Noah, he says that's what happened during the days of Noah. They were doing all kinds of things. And they were wicked. And he says, God told Noah to build an ark, and there were eight souls saved by water. But I thought the water destroyed the world. It did. But it is also the means by which the ark stayed afloat. The like figure, wherein to even baptism, doth also now save us. Rejection of the water, rejection of the news that you must be baptized, rejection of the news in the Noah's day that the ark needs to be, you need to make sure you're on that ark. Repent or perish. And they did not do it. Only Noah and his family. And so often today, people will not be baptized for remission of their sins. Not because they're not capable of it, but they're too stubborn to do it, to submit to God. They don't believe that the water has anything to do with it. Well, the eunuch thought it did. Here's water. And notice 1 Peter 3.21 says, The baptism doth also now save us. It's not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but it is the interrogation of a good conscience toward God through Christ. You don't have a clean conscience with God until you've been baptized in water for the remission of your sins, friends. You reading the passages? There they are. Call in if you'd like a copy of this. We'll send it to you. You can study this on your own. Or we can come out and study it with you. Whatever you would like. But I tell you what, it's not going to change. Because it's Bible. And the Word of God is true. In the book of Acts, there is the conversion of, Pente of the 3,000 at Pentecost, the conversions at Samaria, the conversions at the eunuch, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, the conversion of Cornelius and Lydia, and the jailer, and the Corinthians, and the Ephesians, and many others. And then we see that all of them had one thing in common. In every instance, they were all baptized in water 
for the remission of their sins. And in all the passages we see that belief is involved, repentance is involved, confession is involved. And when it's not necessarily mentioned, it is implied because it is what the Bible teaches. Now, you can't isolate these passages and say, I'm just going to take one, one way of conversion. I'm just going to pick, uh, I'll just pick out the eunuch. And I'll be baptized, I'll be saved like the eunuch was. And there are those that say the story of the eunuch, that he was saved when he believed. Well, was the eunuch saved when he believed? No. Was he saved when he confessed? No. Because he had to have the water. In Christ being preached to the man, he had realized that the water was essential. And when they came to some water, he said, here we are. What's keeping me from being baptized? You see? Someone says, well, I'm just going to uh, take the case of Cornelius. It just says he believed. Well, what is Bible belief? What is Bible faith? It's obedient faith, isn't it? It's not a dead faith or a dormant faith. In Psalm 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord's perfect, converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord, sure. It makes wise the simple. Acts 26, arise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you, this is the case of Saul, to make you a minister and a witness, both the things that you have seen and the things that I will yet reveal to you. I'll deliver you from Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I will now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive what? What does it say? Forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. All right, now go to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Ananias told Paul, now why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Peter said to them in Acts 2, verse 38 through 47, repent and every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So when I'm baptized into Christ, I'm baptized for the remission of my sins, and the Lord adds me to his church. So I'm a member of the church of the Lord when I am baptized for remission of my sins. Look at Acts 3. Repent and be converted that your sins be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your sins. You see the parallels there? Repentance and conversion. Repentance and baptism. Was it different for Acts 3 than Acts 2? Nope. Same things. What was the result? Turn them away from their sins. Okay. So that's conversion. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have then become new. So you see that conversion? The old life's over. And now you're new in Christ. Now, friends, I don't know how you feel about that, but that's a major deal right there. That you can have a new life. Do you know of, of anybody in this life that has known you in your past life that will just forget all about it? You may have lived a pretty rough life. There's one viewer that I hope still watching, Matt, and I hope you're still watching, and you've had a pretty rough life. We've talked. But I tell you what, the Lord's willing to start fresh with you if you'll do what He has told you to do. Some of you are fighting battles right now with drugs and things like that. You know the Lord will turn all that around. He'll forgive every bit of it if you commit and convert to Him. But you have got to turn your back on the sinful things. You can't come dragging it in with you to serve Jesus. Because He doesn't dwell where there's not things unholy. So you have to come in 
by the door and remember that he calls all those who are heavy laden. What does he promise? I'll give you rest. What else have you been trying? Did drugs do it for you? How about alcohol? Did that, did that change your life in a better way? Oh, it changed your life. The drugs did too, didn't they? But you're miserable. And there's somebody that will give you hope. Something you haven't had in a long time. And his name is Jesus. And he'll make you a new creation. He'll make you different. If you'll do what he has said. Is it going to be work? Yep. It will. Is it worth it? Yes. Yes. Everyone that has ever been turned to the Lord will tell you it was worth it. I don't know why I didn't do it earlier. How many people will give you that fresh start that the Lord will give you? If you will turn your back and be converted and be obedient to his will, you know, you know what his promise is? I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be there for you. You walk with me and I'll be there. You walk away from me, that's on you. But you walk with me and you and me together will be more than conquerors anywhere we go. You don't need a big crowd. You just need the Lord. And he will make you new. Why don't you do that? Call us. We'll be glad to help you. In Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ. Seek things that are above. You see that? You see this conversion thing here? If you were raised with Christ then you seek things that are above now. You weren't seeking things above, but if you're raised with Christ in baptism, you're seeking things above now, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Notice this idea. You are seeking things that are above. You are setting your mind on things above, not on the earth. And the reason you do that is because you were baptized and you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You notice that verse 4? Christ, who is your life. That's commitment, isn't it? That's a lifestyle change, friends. That's not a fad. Christ is your life. Set your mind on things above. Seek things that are above where Christ is. Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, Present your body living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but you be transformed. That's the change. That's the conversion. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you do that? By having to transform mind and living like the Lord told you to live. That's how you do it. It's reasonable service. But you've got to set, uh, present your bodies for a living sacrifice daily, holy, and acceptable to God. Keeping yourself where you need to be. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Spirit. And you became examples to everyone in Macedonia and Achaia that believes. For from you the word of the Lord sounded forth. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out. So that we don't need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you turned to God from idols. To serve the living and true God. See that conversion? Turning from, turning toward. Okay. And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, friends, have you been converted? Not merely have you changed your actions. Not merely did you smoke a pack of cigarettes and now you're smoking five. Not did you used to drink a lot and now you're just drinking socially. But have you been changed? Have you turned your back on all that? 
Not did you used to fornicate every week and now you're just doing it once a month. No, 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 that won't work and you know it. Have you been converted? Have you been changed like the Bible says? Are you just a recycled old person? The old man of sin has just been got a, you got a new suit and you're looking good right now, but it'll wear out and you'll be back where you were. Is that the type of life you're living spiritually? Only when you commit to change and make, the, make serving the Lord a lifestyle will you ever be happy like you need to be. Have you been changed in your convictions, in your allegiance, in your thinking? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Has your will changed? Has your commitment changed? This only happens when your relationship with God comes through a knowledge of the truth. Not some counterfeit, not some knockoff idea, but the truth. Salvation based in truth. What a novel idea that we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. Remember Jesus said that? True conversions, friends, as we've talked about this evening, results in a change in who you are. Now, you've still got the same name on your birth certificate, but who owns you? They used to have a time in our country when slaves were registered and the owner was registered. So it's such and such a slave and here's his owner. Now, I know that there's a whole different idea about slavery today, and that's, that's as it should be. But when it comes to spiritual things, friends, do you know what the term the Bible uses for a Christian in his relationship to Christ? Slave. We are doulos. That's the term. And it means a slave. A slave to Jesus. He owns me, and I am his servant. He is a great master, and I am a servant that wants to serve him. My will wants to serve. I'm not coerced into it. I'm not beaten into submission. I want to serve a master such as I have, this Jesus. And I am glad that he owns me, that he has chosen me to be his servant. I'm privileged. So who I am, how I talk, where I go, what I do, how I dress shows that I have a holy lifestyle now. It's, I want to do what is that the perfect will of God. I want to be acceptable to, to the Lord. I want to be, look decent to Him. And I do that by changing the way I talk, the where I go, what I do, and the way I dress and other things. Everything. In core, inside out change. All in. See, hold nothing back. Now, a lot of people are willing to look at their lives and say, you know, I ought to talk better. I, I'll just cuss and that's not a good thing. Or, you know, I'm not going to go to the bar anymore. Uh, I'm going to go to church once a month. Really? Do you know if you went to church services four times a week, and that's Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Sunday morning for Bible study, and Wednesday night. And you did that every week. You know how much of your time of the 168 hours you have each week? You know how much of that would be? How much percentage of that you'd be giving to God? That'd be 2.38%. Do you have 2.38% of your time that you can give to God and worship each, each week? Is that too much for the Lord who died for you and gave it all for you? Gave 100% for you. Is that too much for him to ask of you? That you at least show up at services? 2.38. Now, let's say you're one of those persons that says, I'm just going to go to Sunday morning preaching. Well, you're giving God less than 1% of your time. Wow, how gracious. Are you going to get what you need to get out of being a Christian doing that? Absolutely not. You will be forever miserable because you're not in. 
Christianity to you, serving the Lord to you is a fad. It's not a lifestyle whatsoever. So ask yourself, are you all in for the Lord? Have you been changed? Have you been converted? Has that happened? Proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Men and brethren, what shall we do? you got to change. You know, it would be real easy for the Lord to say, you don't have to do anything. But he never said that. He never said, you have nothing in the world that you should do. You just let me do it all. That's not what he said. You find that in the Bible. Where the Lord said you don't have to do a thing. Now, who provided the way for your salvation? That's God. And he's the only one that could do that. But how does he want us to come to him? By the term come, that demands action, doesn't it? Come to me. When you ask a dog to come to you, come. What, is he, what are you wanting him to do? Sit there and look at you? And say, I'd come to you because you said that. I believe I should come to you. But I'm not going to because you've done it all for me. You'll come get me. You'll lift me up and bring me to you. No. Matthew, Jesus says, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Watch this. Take my yoke on you. That's action, isn't it? Learn of me. That's action. Now, he's willing. He's done what he's going to do. And God's done what he's going to do. And that's through grace. And yes, we're saved through grace. But not by dormant, by being a dormant person that just sits there and says, Okay, the Lord did it. I, I believe it. And that's it. Nope. We must act. We must do what the Lord has told us. The works of God that he has planned for us. We must hear the gospel, believe it, repent of our sins, confess Christ as our Savior, and be baptized in water for the remission of the sins. God's law is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. We're going to talk next week, and starting uh, next two weeks, I'm sorry, on July the 2nd, our first show, we're going to talk about the conversions. And we're going to start in the book of Acts. So, if you will, I want to challenge you to do something. I want you to read the book of Acts. You've got two weeks. Read the book of Acts and go through it and write down what people did to be saved there. Okay? Write it down. And put it all on a sheet. Everything that someone was told to do to be saved. When you get through with that, You'll have all the things that Acts tells us. It's the history of the church. All right. And we'll see what was preached and what people were taught and what they did. And that no one was ever told that all they had to do was nothing. Okay. They were told to do something. Well, what about you and me? Have you been baptized for mission of your sins? Added to the body of Christ? Are you a Christian? Have you been converted? It's what we've talked about all evening. Not merely have you changed your actions, but have you changed your convictions, your allegiance, your thinking, your will, your commitment, and your relationship? Changing who you are, how you talk, where you go, what you do, how you dress. All right. Have you done what they did in the New Testament? Are you a forgiven sinner? Are you saved? Are you a part of the family of God? Are you a member of the Lord's church? Well, again, be converted like the Bible says, friends. Examine how you were saved and say, can I find Bible for what I did? My preacher told me I could be saved by faith only. Where's this, where does faith only found in the Bible? Well, it's over in James 2.24. And it says, not by faith only. Hmm. My preacher told me by faith only. James says, not by faith only. Hmm. My preacher told me I saved by grace only. But then he also told me that that was through faith. 
So I've got grace only through faith only. That's two onlys. That doesn't work. So what do I do now? Let me look at the Bible and let me have a fresh start and let me just forget what I've known and prove what, I'm, what God told me to do, you see. I believe that you will find what you need to do to be saved in the book of Acts. Search it, write it down, and be converted like the Bible says, friends. Search the scriptures, for in them you have life eternal. We want to invite you to attend the Newton Church of Christ that meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Regular assembly times are each Sunday at 9.30, worship at 11, Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. And we want you, to come, want you to come out and be with the brethren during that time. The Word and Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. You can contact us by going to email at contact at wordandsword.com or by phone at 828-465-3009 or by mail at P.O. Box 893. Newton, North Carolina, 28658. The website is www.wordandsword.com. And again, come back with us on July the 2nd, 2019 at 8 o'clock as we continue our study of the Word of God, particularly conversions in the book of Acts. Now, friends, again, we want to thank you for being with us this evening. We want to thank you for the privilege of being on the TV in your home and we hope that you have found a good place to be every Tuesday, every second Tuesday, first and second and third Tuesdays. And that you'll come and be with us all the time. Why don't you call? You can still call us, you can write us, you can do any number of things. And we will do everything we can to make sure that you know the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It's the inspired Word of God. It's the map to heaven particularly the New Testament for us today. And we want you to follow it. And we are all about Bible study, all about trying to find out what you need to do to go to heaven. We care about your souls, friends. And it is the most important thing. Now, I'll tell you what, we don't always say on the air, some of what I've said tonight doesn't always make people happy. But it is the truth. And if it's not the truth, I'm convinced it is. Why don't you convince me if it's not? And you show me from the Bible, and I'll come on this program and say, I've been wrong, and I'll change what I preach. You be my friend, and I hope you consider us your friend when we tell you what the truth is. Thank you so much again for letting us be in your home. We hope you'll study your Bible, read through it, know what it says, and then apply it. Be changed by God's Word. Thank you, and good evening.